Six Keys to Shoulder Instability Physical Therapy Rehabilitation. Kevin, I forgot what we're doing today. What are we doing today? I think we're on the shoulder. Is that what we're working on? Yes, you're yes. right. That's, that is it. Good. I like yes, the shoulder. Very good. We see a lot of shoulders at uh, Champion, I feel like. A lot of athletes get shoulder injuries, so this could be important. Yes, for sure. I agree with you. Um, so we basically had three podcasts about shoulder instability, and we tried to cover all the basics, talked about the basics of shoulder instability, and then we talked a little bit about whether or not your patient should have surgery, and we talked about the rehab principles. Now we're going to take those principles and hopefully make them a little more practical. So when a patient comes through the door, not only do you know quite a bit about shoulder instability and maybe some of those next steps, but what you're going to do from a rehab perspective. So that's what this one's all about today. So we're going to go over six keys. Uh, number one, are they actually a candidate for physical therapy? Number two, the direction of instability, that's going to dictate the exercise that you choose. The degree of instability, which is also going to dictate where you start with your exercise and how hard you push them. Number four, we're going to talk about the rotator cuff. That baby is very important for these folks. Talk about restoring proprioception, which is number five. One of the big things folks lose after shoulder instability, after dislocation. And lastly, getting specific. So returning back to sport or whatever activity that individual wants to get back to. Anything to add, Kevin? No, that's all good stuff. I think it's going to be a good layout and hopefully, you know, very helpful for our listeners to go through and figure out how to design a rehab program for, for these folks. I agree. Well, hopefully we'll see, right? You guys be the judge. Let us know in the comments. If it's garbage then let us know, or don't tell us, you know, but tough is good. It makes us feel good. Just oh, kidding. Yeah. Tell us everything. We want it all. Number one, is your patient a good candidate for physical therapy? And we already hit this quite a bit. Um, I just think it's super important. So if we take away anything from these podcasts, I think this is going to be one of the put, uh, most important points, right? Uh, is this actually an ideal candidate for physical therapy? And there's a lot of things to think about. So does the individual in front of you, have they been dealing with subluxations where the shoulder's been moving, pops out, comes right back in again? Or have they had dislocations, which are probably going to have bank art lesion, bony pathology, potentially rotator cuff pathology associated? Those folks maybe need more surgery, whereas the person has subluxation to be more of a multi-direction instability, and they're going to do better with physical therapy. Do they have any concomitant pathology? Like I just said, if you fully dislocate, you probably have a bank art tear, right? Which probably is going to need some sort of surgical fixation. Is there any bone loss, any cuff involvement, which these things are also going to dictate whether or not you need to have surgery. What type of instability do you have? And we didn't talk about this much, but there's a little bit of research looking at anterior versus posterior instability. And what they'll find is the folks with posterior instability tend to do a little bit better conservatively, whereas the folks with anterior instability tend to have more recurrences and things like osteoarthritis over the course of time. So if you have posterior instability, you might be thinking more physical therapy, where if it's anterior, maybe referring back to the surgeon a little bit sooner. The other two types are multi-direction instability as well as acquired instability. And these two tend to do better with physical therapy. We're not pushing them to surgery right away. The other one that's interesting is age. So generally the cutoff is going to be under 30 or over 30. So if you're over 30, you're much less likely to have recurrences. If you're under the age of 30, you're more likely to have recurrence. If you're very young, you're even, even more likely to have recurrences. So if you have an older individual, sometimes we don't think about doing surgery, but younger, it's definitely on the forefront of our mind. A uh, quick little anecdote. I had a patient that had like almost a 360 degree tear of his labrum at the age of, I think, 52. And he got an opinion. The doctor's like, you definitely need to have surgery for this. And then he got a second opinion to one of the surgeons we really like locally. And the second surgeon's like, let's let this thing scar down and see how it, it does, right? And what's hilarious is that he did great. <laughs> he had no problems whatsoever. Um, so even if they do have a lot of pathology um, with a dislocation, if they're advanced in age, not trying to get back to too much or laying down that stiffer collagen, it might do very well. And what's also interesting is that this individual also felt very stable too. So when I took him to end range external rotation, extension, flexion, it felt stiff. It felt like he had actually stiffened up quite a bit and uh, had a lot of stability there. So just kind of interesting little story. Next thing to think about is activity level. Do you have an individual that's trying to get back to a contact sport like football where they have a much higher recurrence rate or do you have a librarian that's just trying to put books back on the shelf, right? So someone who's not involved in a contact sport and someone who's not in a sport at all is probably going to be less likely to need surgery. 
And the last one is recurrences. Have you had just one dislocation or have you had many? Right. So if you have one dislocation, you have a better chance of rehabbing conservatively. If you have multiple, there's a chance it's going to continue going over the course of time. Right. The big risk there is that if you don't have surgery and you have more recurrences, you can have more damage each time you recur. So you can have bony damage. You might have rotator cuff pathology, rotator cuff tearing that occurs. And then you have a greater chance of future osteoarthritis. So make sure that these things are, are in your mind when you have a patient with instability. A champion where uh, direct access, we see a lot of folks for the first time, they didn't see a doctor yet. So I want to make sure that we understand these, these principles to make sure they get the right care, right? And we were just talking about this before, but not other doctors and medical professionals are up to date on all of this information. So sometimes the doctors are not giving their patients great information. So just make sure that they have this information and you send them to a good doctor they can really trust and who knows their stuff, okay? Anything to add there? I just went crazy. Uh, that was really good. I, I think what popped into my head was just uh, kind of that age old like trope of it depends. You know, I think it kind of there's no clear answer. There's so much to it. And I think you're when you're first meeting the patient and you're going through your subjective, um, every question that you're asking has to have. It's telling you something. It's telling you more about the patient it's telling you the mechanism of injury the direction of of instability and their age and all that stuff is part of the algorithm to help us figure out um what to do is this someone that we need to refer out is this someone that we need to you know we could try to keep in house um you know definitely an it depends type uh situation but having all these key uh questions that we've gone over will help you make a better decision in the clinic for, for the patient. So yeah, I think that was good. Agree. Totally. We also did a poll podcast on this and I'll leave a link in the show notes. You guys want to check that out when we're trying to decide whether or not your patient should have surgery or not. Um, I think that's also a good episode. I'm biased just because I'm part of the podcast, but I thought it was good <laughs> to go along with the video today. I have a little gift for you. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet for shoulder instability. It's a four page PDF that goes over everything you need to know about shoulder instability. We go over prevalence, anatomy, joint arthrokinematics, risk factors, and different types of instability, causes of instability, whether or not your patient should undergo surgery or have conservative care like physical therapy, and finally rehab implications for all the different types of instability. So if you're looking to get up to speed about shoulder instability in less than 10 minutes, then this PDF is for you. I'll leave a link in the show notes in the description. Go ahead and click on that and then download it and then get back to what you're learning about right now. Cool. Number two, second principle is going to be the direction of instability, right? So this comes back to rolls and glides of the joint. So kind of going back to PT school to try to figure out uh, the direction of instability and what kind of movements you have to be careful with initially. It also relates back to that mechanism of injury. If you have anterior instability, anything that pushes the ball forward or anteriorly in the socket, you have to be careful with. So the motions of external rotation, horizontal abduction, and extension will push the ball anteriorly in the socket. So early on, you have to be very careful with those end ranges. So you're often doing a lot of partial range of motion stuff. However, we can probably get away with end range flexion, potentially. We can probably get away with more cross body work. We can get away with more end range internal rotation just because the instability is going to be in one direction. So it helps to guide you in terms of which motions are going to be important. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if someone has anterior instability and they need to get back to horizontal abduction, external rotation, we have to really really hammer those positions and get incredibly strong there because now you're probably lacking capsular restraint or if you stretched out that ligament quite a bit if it's not torn right we need to be super strong in those positions so early on starting with partial range of motion and later on we have to get extremely strong at end ranges that were provocative initially for the posterior instability these folks are going to have trouble with end range flexion which will stress the posterior and inferior capsule, internal rotation, and also cross-body uh, horizontal adduction. All these motions are usually where people get hurt in the first place, right? And they're also the places you have to protect early on and then really strengthen in the end stages. 
For folks who have multi-direction instability, they're probably loose in a variety of different directions. So I think what's important for these folks is that you're just careful with the end ranges that are provocative initially. And then at the end of their rehab, we have to get back to those positions and anything that the athlete wants to get back to specifically. So let's say they want to be back to snatching. They need to get really stable end range, abduction, external rotation. Those motions are very important because we see that when you catch a snatch, right? So to summarize, we're avoiding the ranges that are provocative initially due to that instability event. And then eventually we got to get really, really strong in those positions. What do you think there? Kevin, I think that's a, a great way to think about the rehab process, right? So if you figure out on your initial evaluation, what direction of instability they had, and then when you're going through your testing, it's confirming that, you know, they had anterior instability and they're pretty apprehensive in that extended shoulder position, or kind of in that external rotated position where we know the humeral heads gliding anteriorly. Those are positions we really want to hammer towards the end of rehab. So almost think of like a clearance for return to sport. Are they now more comfortable in these positions that were once very provocative? So I like the way that you were thinking, you know, that you think about that is early on, let's respect that tissue, let it heal, let it scar down. But then as the rehab process goes, we have to slowly dose that stuff in and then really kind of hammer it and make sure that they're comfortable there. Yeah, I agree. The other part too is that if you get the end stages of rehab and they're just really not tolerating those end ranges, you've tried a lot, it's not improving, then maybe that's the patient you end up sending back to surgery just because they just kind of failed the conservative treatment. Next step would be some sort of surgery, right? Number three, <clears throat> degree of instability. And I think largely what this comes down to is how bad is it? Now, a lot of times this is going to come down to what you're seeing in the MRI. So how much tearing is there? Is there going to be bone loss? <clears throat> so on and so forth. But I think the other piece is just how do they present, right? Because you are not your MRI, right? Your MRI may show something, but you actually move quite well. So a lot of this, I think, comes down to the subjective and objective examination. So asking them which positions feel unstable, and they'll kind of show you probably. They'll say, oh, it kind of feels unstable when I go into this position. And you're kind of like, whoa, 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 don't dislocate your shoulder on me. Uh, but they'll kind of show you and they'll tell you which positions they feel unstable. And for someone that has anterior instability, for some folks, they, they really can't do much of anything and they start feeling very unstable. And other folks have quite a bit of range of motion, right? So you'll tease out a lot of that in the subjective examination. And then when you start doing the objective, you're just going to get more and more information. And I always go very slow when I'm doing the range of motion testing, but going into flexion slowly, do you feel instability? Yes or no. And then where? Right. And then just see where they're at on the other side. Are they getting instability end range or are they getting, you know, instability 50% through that range of motion? I think those are actually pretty good objective measurements to test throughout the course of the rehab. See if they're having less and less instability as we progress further along. We're not just like cranking them into layback and saying, does this feel unstable? Like, ah, and then th like two months later, you do the same exact thing and it still feels unstable. They may have gotten better. It's just that we don't know how much because you never got a good reading from the, the beginning. So I think that's a, a little clinical pearl that you can take with your patients. Um, and the other no brainer thing to start with is going to be partial ranges of motion. So let's say someone has anterior instability and I still want to take them into the gym and test that stability with, let's say a bench press. So when you do a bench press, you go into shoulder extension, which is going to drive that humeral head forward into the instability, I want to go slowly. So maybe I start with a partial range of motion. How does that feel? Let's go a little bit deeper. Does it feel okay? Feels great. Okay. Let's try full range of motion. If they start with partial range, how does that feel? Let's go a little deeper. doesn't feel good. Feels a little unstable. Okay. Let's start with that partial range of motion. And that kind of brings us to our next point is that really what you're doing is trying to meet them where they are, right? And I really like the phase rehab approach. We talked about this a little bit in the last podcast, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. And I think that's a really good framework. It's a great way to learn it. But in reality, you're going to have people that kind of come in at all different stages. And that might be because they had a fresh injury or they're a couple months out, right? Or just the degree of instability. I'll tell you what, when I had my posterior dislocation, almost immediately, I could do everything in the gym, right? which speaks to that degree of instability. There were certainly certain positions I couldn't tolerate, but I could do bench press, pull-ups, rows. I could do everything nice and heavy. Really nothing gave me a lot of trouble unless I got into very specific positions. 
So if I had started with like only, let's say external rotation, a partial range and like scaption, and that was it, I might've been underdosing myself, right? So at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out what can this person handle? Obviously it gotta be safe, but we wanna make sure we don't underdose and we wanna make sure we don't overdose. So we take them to the gym, we try some things, we try activities, and we just kind of figure out where they are and try to meet them where they are, right? What are your thoughts there, Kevo? Yeah, that's, that's such a good point. I, I think that's something that, you know, you do so well in the clinic is someone has, say, anterior instability in this in this example, and um, we're, we know we're going to do some conservative rehab, and we're going to avoid things early on or modify something like a bench press where we know we're stressing the anterior capsule. But I think you do a great job of taking them out to the gym and figuring out what's the highest amount of activity that they can tolerate. So if there was no damage to their posterior capsule, they might feel great doing some rows as long as they're not, you know, kind of dipping and stressing the anterior capsule at end range, but they can still get a very high training effect oftentimes if their instability is pretty low. So, you know, we don't want to just think that they're very unstable anteriorly. So we have to stay on the table and do these very, very gentle open chain exercises or, or isometrics. Um, although that might be the right place to start for somebody, uh, getting a good read on what the degree of instability is and getting a good read on their goals. And, you know, I know someone like you, if you were my patient and I said, Dan, we're just going to do a bunch of isometrics and uh, gentle range of motion. Uh, you would be itching to get back into the gym as soon as possible. And I'd probably lose you as a patient. So, or you'd probably just go do a bunch of things and maybe risk, risk re-injuring it on your own. So I think, uh, you know, figuring that out and, and, and trying to have them do as much as possible to keep their normal routine is going to be huge for them. So I thought that was, that's a good point. Yeah. That's the first thing I thought it, if, you know, I would probably just go in the gym and try a bunch of stuff myself and I would do my rehab on top of that, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I think a lot of patients that we get are like that, you know, they're very self-motivated. They love exercise and taking everything away. If we don't have to, is like one of the worst things you could do. Yeah. Yeah. But the other they, part too is, um, you gotta be safe, right? I think there are some pretty dire repercussions of this. Um, something like a rotator cuff related pain, rotator cuff tendinopathy, subacromial pain. I think, uh, to steal a term from Chris Johnson, you can be a little more cavalier, right? You can do more with it. And, you know, worse comes to worse. You're a little extra sore for a few days. You set yourself back some, um, you know, worst case scenario with anterior instability, you redislocate right in the gym, doing stuff that's supposed to make you stronger, right. And rehab you. So I, I still think you have to be careful with this, but I also am of the mindset that we should be trying to exercise our patients as much as possible. We want them to be outside of the gym for as little as possible. Obviously there's so much health benefit to being in the gym. People love it. They're going to love you as a physical therapist. If you can figure out a way to have them continue doing the things that they love, you're going to create healthier, happier people, so on and so forth. I get off my soapbox right now. It's probably annoying. Uh, but yeah, try to keep people in the gym doing stuff that they can do. I think that's also going to help them from a rehab perspective, because I can't imagine, you know, if they can't talk, if they can tolerate some heavier pressing, it's not going to be beneficial to build some stability in that shoulder joint, right? Over just sideline external rotation, which we also love, obviously. If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now, I'm actually a really big fan of education and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal with the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important they understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better, they go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. 
The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seat of reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. The second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later. So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. And now back to your learning. Number four, hammer the rotator cuff. So Kevin, do you think the rotator cuff is important for the shoulder? No, I think it's, isn't it like an accessory structure, like your appendix? Yeah, it's, it's like not... a platysmus, you know, used to serve a, a function or like your appendix, right? Yeah, you really yeah I think it's slowly fading out of evolution. I don't think we need it much. For sure, yeah. Uh, kidney aside, I think the rotator cuff is probably the most important structure for these patients um, that you really, really need to focus on it early on, especially. Um, and I think isolating it early on is going to be very, very important. I imagine there's probably going to be some inhibition. So if you think about someone that had a patellar dislocation or they had ACL reconstruction surgery or something along those lines, there's a ton of inhibition to the quad. The same thing is probably happening when someone has a major injury within their shoulder joint. We just can't really see those muscles, right? Um, you know, if someone has Achilles repair, the, the calf gets tiny. Someone has ACL reconstruction, the quad gets tiny. Someone has rotator cuff repair or major shoulder surgery, the cuff is getting smaller too and weaker. You just can't see it, right? So I do think that the cuff is kind of like the quad, although I, I don't have a ton of research to support that. I know there's some, right? Um, but I do think it's very important that we focus on the rotator cuff because after a major injury, I bet you it's not working as well as it once did. And the second piece is now you're missing that as a primary, you're missing some other primary restraints of the shoulder. So if you think about what restrains the shoulder, the first are the bony restraints, right? So you have the humeral head and the glenoid. And it's funny because we always talk about this structure being very unstable. And if you compare it to the hip, it is, right? But through our research, we know that the more glenoid you lose, the more likelihood you have of re-dislocating, right? So the little bone that you have is very, very important. So if you start to lose any bone, so much so that if you're above, let's say, around 25%, it's almost like an absolute indication to get surgery for this we're going to be less and less stable, right? The other piece is that if you're having an anterior instability dislocation, then you're probably tearing the uh, inferior band, or excuse me, the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So you've most likely torn a major support structure within the shoulder. Now, what do you have left over to control motion? Well, essentially you have the rotator cuff. So that's the last thing that you have that's providing stability within the joint. So now the rotator cuff has just gotten way, way, way more important. What are your thoughts there, Kevin? Because I'm talking a lot. I want to give you a chance to say some stuff if you have anything. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's definitely the biggest focus that we have with our instability patients. Um, you know, we see a lot of that acquired type instability just with the overhead athletes that we treat. And I think, you know, Specifically with baseball, we know that throwing is stressful on the rotator cuff and it can reduce strength over the course of the season in your rotator cuff. Um, and then you take someone who starts to lose their strength in the cuff that's providing a lot of the stability. 
yeah, so perhaps these players have a lot of acquired instability from years and years of throwing, getting back into external rotation, and the capsule becomes compromised, and strengthening the rotator cuff there is super important, and it's something that we do very often. And it's something that we test regularly. We we try to get objective testing and make sure that we're heading in the right direction. So I think, you know, the, the person in front of you can feel they're getting stronger. They're progressing their weights in their exercise program, but also doing some dynamometer testing is helpful, I think. Um, I have a question for you, though. I'm curious what you think about um, in terms of dosing for strength, the rotator cuff. So uh, if we're doing something with these, you know, smaller muscles, I think it's pretty typical in a lot of outpatient PT settings that you'll see people doing exercises with a TheraBand or they're using some weights and they're doing something like two or three sets of like 10 or 15 repetitions. Uh, what do you have in mind when you're trying to strengthen these folks? Because, you know, I think you do a good job with this. Um, are you thinking of something like, do you do higher reps with these smaller muscles? Are you thinking of going with an intensity of like a reps in reserve type thing? Or are, are you happy doing what you do with a lot of other strengthening and doing a little bit lower reps for higher weight? I think, how do you think about that? Yeah. So I think early on in rehab, we're probably thinking about tolerance first. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we're starting with easy stuff because we don't want to aggravate the joint too much. We don't want to create more pain, more swelling, perpetuate a problem that's already going on. We kind of want the opposite. So I think early on, I think more of neuromuscular control as well as just tolerance. So we're trying to get to the point where people can tolerate more loading. So if we're thinking about, let's say, a sideline dumbbell external rotation, uh, first and foremost, I think that's it's usually tolerated pretty well. But we'll start with slightly higher repetitions and lighter loads just because we want to make sure that it's not too provocative. Uh, simply because higher loads, higher weights tend to be a little bit more provocative. And I might actually um, program a lot of repetitions throughout the course of the day, just because we're trying to reestablish control. The way I kind of explain this to patients is that if you're like a painter and you want to get really good at painting, we want to try to paint very, very frequently to develop the skill of painting. And I think when we're trying to establish neuromuscular control. If we do a lot of repetitions, we're reteaching the muscle how to fire appropriately right? When it comes to strength, I think, uh, fortunately for us, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, I think a, you start using a little bit more weight, right? So we're just using more weight for a sideline external rotations. Uh, we're going to the point where we're starting to approach failure, right? Um, uh, lots of really interesting research coming out recently. I won't get too far into depth. Um, but if you're training, let's say four to six, even up to seven reps in reserve, you're getting a similar training effect as approaching failure. And sometimes when you hit failure, you're actually getting a worse strength training effect, depending on the study that you reach. So usually now what I've been doing when I talk to patients is when they, when I want them to start approaching failure and I'm choosing somewhere in between the rep range of 10 to 12, I'll say, let's keep four to six reps in reserve, because I think that is reflected in the literature we have about how, how to optimally um, push strength, right? You just have to be careful that if you go heavier, 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 it doesn't aggravate the shoulder, right? The other obvious thing I think you can do is you can start to drop the repetition sum. So you can start going from sets of 10 to 12 down to six to eight, right? What I will say is that I'm, I'm not really going much below, let's say five for sideline dumbbell external rotation, but I will start approaching that rep range for something like a bench press over the course of time. And I think the last variable that you can tweak a little bit from a strength perspective it's going to be frequency and volume. So they're kind of one and the same. So if you're doing more volume and splitting it up over multiple days, that's more frequency, right? Uh, but we do have research to show that the higher the frequency is, the greater the strength gain, right? So volume seems to be king from a hypertrophy and strength perspective. Just the more often you're doing something, the more strength and muscle mass you're going to build promise or probably there's certainly going to be diminishing um, effects, but now we're fine up to like 52 sets of an exercise per week. Every set increase just keeps on going up and up and up from a hypertrophy standpoint. So um, you just have to be careful not to flare someone up. But if you're trying to build strength, obviously you can drop the repetitions. You can do the, the, the motion a little bit faster, right? Uh, you can increase the load. You can lower uh, the rep and reserve and you can do the exercise more frequently. All those things are going to be beneficial ways to increase strength. 
That's awesome. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that four to seven reps in reserve. So that's that's good to know. And yeah, it's, you know, it's, I, it's, that's, I mean, that's one of the best pieces of news I've received in a long time because I'm constantly trying to keep people strong and reduce the load they're training at because they can't tolerate it. Mm. And if I can just drop the rep in reserve and you're going to continue increasing your strength at the same exact rate, I don't know. I get, I tell people about that study all the time. <laughs> Yeah, probably they go awesome. crazy because like this is stupid. Like this isn't that relevant, but in my world, it's incredibly relevant. Totally, so, totally. Another thing to think about with instability, and this becomes really important when you're talking about return to sport and keep people safe long term, is that if you have anterior instability, the primary restraint to the ball moving forward in the socket is going to be the posterior cuff. So we work with a lot of baseball players, and they acquire anterior instability. So we go bananas on the posterior cuff. The posterior cuff is so important. And Kevin already spoke about this, but we're trying to test external rotation strength. And we're constantly looking at that number over the course of time to see if we're progressing because we know that's going to be extremely important for these individuals. However, if you have a posterior instability patient, you probably want to try to stress the anterior cuff a little more so, right? We usually think posterior cuff, posterior cuff, posterior cuff. Well, if you have a posterior instability, and basically, your anterior cuff is going to reduce that posterior translation. So in theory, the anterior cuff is going to be a little bit more important. So for a guy like me who has posterior instability, I'm constantly working on my anterior cuff a lot. I'm getting my subscap as strong as possible. I tell folks in the gym that I'm trying to prepare for an arm wrestling tournament when they ask me weird questions about what I'm doing. Just kidding. I don't, don't do that. But you can think about that direction of instability when you're applying exercises. And when you get to higher level exercises, and the person's getting back to sport, we really have to train that cuff in that specific position because that's going to be the primary restraint to another instability event. Number five, restore proprioception. Now, this one, I think it should be a little more obvious than it actually is. So when someone has like ACL reconstruction or maybe even more obvious when someone sprains their ankle, we are so concerned about restoring proprioception. We have those people on balance boards. We're tossing balls at them. We got the blaze pods going. We're doing perturbations. We're doing like every balance exercise in the book, right? But when someone has instability, we're not always thinking in the same way. But we have pretty clear research to show that after people have a dislocation, if people have capsular laxity, or after they've had a surgical fixation, so a bank art repair, they have reduced proprioception. So I think that's a really important element that we have to focus on from a rehab perspective, right? In terms of what interventions we have, I think it's pretty obvious when you think about the lower extremity, we just do a ton of balance exercises, but what do you do for someone that has instability within the shoulder joint? Well, for one, I think you can do the same exact thing. You can do closed chain exercises on unstable surface. You can do all sorts of different things with that. So in a push-up position on a wobble board, you can have them try to reach in different positions while you're balancing in one hand, uh, all sorts of stuff you can get creative with, right? You can also do a lot of eyes closed work. So essentially any exercise you're doing with your eyes open, you just do the same exact thing with your eyes closed. It's kind of wonky, but if you're doing, let's say, a bench press, your eyes open, you can really easily tell where that barbell is in space. As soon as you close your eyes, things get very unstable and it's hard to control those. Another thing I didn't write on here is that you can use unstable implements. So if I was to do, let's say, a dumbbell bench press, if I uh, switched out the dumbbell for a kettlebell bottoms up press, it's very unstable. That's a great way to train or train. When I had my instability within the shoulder, I used an earthquake bar or a bamboo bar, and I attached bands to the end uh, and attached weights to those bands. So essentially the bar is earthquaking, right, as the name implies, shaking like crazy. Shoulder joint has to work like crazy to stabilize that motion. I felt like I built a ton of stability within the joint there. And the last piece that we work on a lot is rhythmic stabilization. Uh, Kevin, do you want to talk about our rhythmic stabilization program at Champion? Because I know we do. you do this all the time, every single day. I do it too, but I know you do it a little bit more. Yeah, so the way that we kind of organize that is, um, you know, after we're on the table doing some passive range of motion, just assessing, seeing how things are. Uh, we like to do like a six position rhythmic stabilization sequence. So if you picture someone supine, uh, we bring their arm to about 45 degrees of flexion. So arm straight, about 45 degrees of flexion. And we do rhythmic stabilizations in that 
that amount of flexion, we go up to 90 degrees. We go up to about 120 or more up to end range when they get better. Uh, and then we also are doing external rotation at 90 degrees of abduction. Um, we're doing external rotation with 45 degrees of external rotation and then all the way back and lay back. Um, and then we're kind of really working the shoulder in a bunch of different directions. Uh, for folks that have more like a posterior instability, uh, we could do that in some internal rotation. We can bring them cross body. Uh, we do eyes open, eyes closed. So, you know, obviously when we're first starting, we do pretty predictable eyes open type, almost like isometric work. But then as they get more and more comfortable, um, I do have them close their eyes pretty early. I mean, we make that like a later phase, but I think that's kind of important for folks to, like you mentioned, uh, when you can't see where the resistance is coming from, you're really using that reactive stability to figure that out. So, um, and then we can do that in different amounts of scapular protraction. So we'll have someone kind of punch up towards the ceiling and now they're getting a little bit of accessory from their serratus and doing rhythmic stabilizations there. So, you know, you can make this pretty aggressive. Obviously we start out maybe five or 10 seconds each position, but then as they get better, I might spend a little more time there, uh, alternate eyes open, eyes closed. Um, and it's fun. It's fun for the patient. You know, they kind of feel like it's a game. Uh, it's fun. It's fun as the PT to see their progression over time. You know, early on, they could be very, very wobbly, but they might progress. Uh, they might progress pretty quickly. And, you know, I think that's good. So, for people that might need a visual for that, um, I know Mike Reynolds' YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure he's posted about six position rhythmic stabilizations in the past. Um, so, you know, he has great content on that. And, you know, I think Mike or Kevin Wilkes' Instagram definitely has some. I'm, I'm sure there's some somewhere in the fitness pain free Instagram. So, yeah. yeah, we utilize that a ton. And, you know, that's from stuff we've been taught. You know, for me, stuff I've been taught from Mike and Lenny. Uh, it's been really helpful for my shoulder patients. Yeah, I'll put a link. I have some uh, more advanced ones I have that I like a lot. I can put a link if you guys are kind of interested in what they look like. But it, just to, you know, Kevin nailed it. Like, I learned it from these guys. I'm stealing it directly from them. So go check out uh, Kevin Wilk and Mike stuff. They have a lot of really good content, Instagram, YouTube, where they show you about these rhythmic stabilizations. Number six is getting specific. And this is usually a little bit later on in terms of rehabilitation. So early on, you're trying to calm things down a little bit, restore range of motion, restore baseline strength. Eventually, they're going to get closer and closer back to their activities. And depending on what they want to get back to, you may have more or less of a tall task, right? So if someone wants to get back to rugby, that's a lot, right? We know that they're going to have to tolerate end ranges of motion. They're going to have to tolerate end ranges of motion with fast forces. Their arm's going to get ripped back potentially. They're also going to have the risk of falling with the arm behind them, right? In the same exact position. There's a lot of positions that that individual is going to have to handle with high forces, high speeds, all that stuff, right? So we really have to work on getting very strong and very stable in all of these positions. And that's really going to dictate whether or not you think they're safe to get back. And basically, you know, you get an idea of how likely they are to have recurrence. If they feel very stable, very strong in those positions, athlete is very confident in their shoulder. I think they're going to have a better result than if they're trying to get in those positions. They just feel super wobbly. First time they get into that position with high speed, high load, I just don't know if that shoulder is going to handle it very well, right? Um, we talked about this already, but baseball players, what do they need to get back to? So if they have anterior instability, they're going to notice those symptoms in layback. When we're really cranked back into external rotation, that's the position where the anterior structure is going to be most challenged. So we have to make sure that we really build that back up over the course of time. And then we slowly ramp back into throwing. So I think uh, Mike Reynolds probably got one of the best papers on return to throwing. It was just released. Do um, you remember what um, journal that was in, Kevin? I think it was in IJSPT. That's what I was going to say too, but I might be wrong there. Maybe we'll try to throw a link in the bio there or link on the description. Um, but yeah, we have a very gradual return to throw program, uh, very evidence-based. Uh, Mike just released a paper on this, which is phenomenal. The champion, I think we have like 75 return to throw programs all based on like what injury you've had, what position you're playing, all that stuff. A lot of that's beyond me. I pick a program. I talk to Lenny and make sure I'm not doing anything stupid. But the idea is you're starting with less. And you're working up to more over the course of time. 
And then you also might be dealing with an athlete that is trying to tolerate a very different type of stress. And I think a good example that I work with all the time is going to be Olympic weightlifting. So think about a snatch. You're taking a weight from the floor, maximal load, throwing it overhead and catching it in extreme end range shoulder abduction, right? For someone that has anterior instability or multi-direction instability, that's a pretty darn tough position for the shoulder to be able to handle. So we have to very, very thoroughly strengthen that position, provide a ton of stability there, and then slowly ramp back into the Olympic lifts over the course of time just to make sure we don't have a bunch of recurrences, right? What do you think about that one there, Gavin? Yeah, that's all really good stuff. I think the the one thing I try to really focus on when I evaluate a new patient and something I talk to the students about um, is figuring out what their end goal is. And, you know, that's really, really important because a lot of times students will have trouble figuring out where to start treatment. But I think if you work your way back from the end goal, for me, it makes it a lot more clear where I should be starting and where we're heading. So it gives the the treatment progression, uh, some sort of like a roadmap. So I think everything you said there was great. And I think that's how I would use that information is I would try to try to learn what, what we have to get back to, and then try to make our rehab, uh, trend towards that as we progress over time. So now that Kevin has thoroughly educated you on six keys to rehabilitation, shoulder instability, you probably need a little case study to see what we're talking about. Well, I have a link for you. It's going to be over top of Kevin's head right now. Oh, right up there. Yep. Click on that where we go over case study of a patient of mine that had multi-direction instability. And she really wasn't able to do much due to pain and feelings of instability. And we had her all the way back up to high level CrossFit. So go ahead and click on that. It's a case study. I'll show you exactly how I did it. I'll see you in that video. And lastly, if you want to go that next step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. So Insiders is like Netflix for physical therapists and coaches working with painful folks in the gym. You've got access to 100 plus webinars, eBooks, and courses. More recently, I've been taking all of my best content from YouTube. I've been taking out all the ads. I've been organizing it in a really step-by-step -step fashion an entire course so you can easily go through it and I add additional pieces to this to enhance your learning, right? So I just finished up my lateral ankle sprain course. And one of the big things I add to this was a protocol. So essentially, what do you do week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, six, seven, eight, you know me, I like working with athletes. I like working with really fit and strong people. So it's going to be a lot more robust than your typical protocol. Also, you have access to me. So inside of insiders, you can leave a comment and I'll get right back to you. I also have physical therapy CEUs inside of insiders. So if you take the course essential coaches series, get a bunch of CEUs. And what's even better is you can start for just $1. After that, it's $25 per month. It's going to be the cheapest CEUs you can get. It's by far the highest value program that I offer at the cheapest price. So head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders to get started. I'll also leave a link in the show notes where you can check it out.